welcome uh, welcome to another uh, uh, webinar uh, uh, victims of communist memorial foundation uh, has been honored to include several experts uh, specialists in in their countries and specialists in uh, the the, the uh, work that cuba has been uh, doing and the threat that cuba has been imposing in uh, latin america and in other countries in our series a uh, cuba a communist threat uh, we have been uh, contributing uh, with a major exposure uh, to the threats from the Cuba regime. And in particular, we have been focusing the first uh, two months of these, uh, these programs in the Cuba and medical missions and the, the way that Cuba has been profiting uh, using the exploitation, the human trafficking and uh, the human rights violations to the Cuban doctors and the abuse from the Cuba regime in other countries and, uh, and how they have been hiding this as humanitarian and uh, how the regime has been making millions and millions of dollars uh, exploiting uh, some uh, Cuban doctors in some countries and uh, exploiting the tragedy of uh, these countries in terms of achieving better healthcare system for uh, their people. So today uh, for us is also, it is an honor to have a, 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 an specialist, a good friend. Uh, a, he has been working, fighting a, for rule of law, for democracy. Not only in his country, Ecuador, he has been fighting at the regional level. A, a Mauricio Alarcón, He's a uh, he's a fighter. He's vocal uh, against the the abuse of power. Vocal against uh, the the authoritarians. He uh, fought against uh, Correa in his own country. Actively engaged in uh, in the promotion of human rights and democracy in his country. And uh, and also he has been uh, uh, fighting for freedom of expression, uh, freedom of association not only in Ecuador, but also at the regional level. He is a uh, part of the Youth Network for Democracy with Rosa Maria Payá and other young leaders from the region. He also has been part of the Latin American Caribbean Network for Democracy. He is one of the founders of uh, Punda Medios, an active organization that was key uh, fighting for restoring democracy and fundamental freedoms in, in Ecuador. And he is a executive director of the Fundación Ciudadanía y Desarrollo, a great organization that has been collaborating, uh, bringing rule of law, bringing independence, working in Ecuador with different different groups to promote uh, better governance and, uh, and more transparency in the in the government of Ecuador. Uh, he has a. Uh, a, a long experience, even though he's young, he has been uh, working at the regional level. He has experience working at the Organization of American States. He uh, is graduated in political science from the University of San Francisco, but also he has a, a master in political action. But I believe that the best master is his work at the regional and uh, level. I mean, he's in his own country. Uh, Mauricio, it's an honor, uh, it's a pleasure to share with you this space. Uh, we normally share space at the Organization of American State fighting against the totalitarian, the authoritarians. But now we have the, the opportunity to have this uh, Q&A and this uh, opportunity to share some views. Uh, the Cuban doctors, the Cuban medical programs uh, in Ecuador, you have been researching and you elaborated a, re a good report about what happened in Ecuador, uh, how they explode this uh, medical uh, uh, professionals in, in Ecuador, and how these missions, part of the mission was a, a major fraud because there were spies and uh, in a, a lot of manipulation from the Cuban regime. What do you have to say about these uh, medical missions? And uh, by the way, how Ecuador got rid of those uh, medical missions? Well, Carlos, first of all, thank you. Thank you very much for your kind uh, words, for that kind introduction. As uh, you remember very well, we work together in a lot of missions, calling missions the advocacy actions before the inter-American system, before the 
uh, the, the Organization of American States, even I remember before the UN Human Rights Council. So we have been working together very hard on, on human rights and democracy activism during uh, this few years, these many years. And thank you very much for, for saying that I am young. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not part of the, of the youth networks anymore. Now I'm part of the advisory council of the youth networks as I am 36 right now. But thank you very much for your kind uh, introduction of your kind uh, words, dear Carlos. And of course, we were invited by victims of communism uh, to talk about what has happened uh, with the Cuban medical missions. And I would like to, to like give you some data and some information regarding uh, what has happened in, in Ecuador, basically. And as an introduction, I would like to say that there is no mission anymore in Ecuador because after the public protests that took place in October, maybe you remember those huge national protests that took place in October last year, the Ecuadorian government, directly uh, la ministra de gobierno, Maria Paula Romo, said that the Ecuadorian government was going to end all the health agreements signed with Cuba. And it was a huge surprise because the missions were being there for many, many years since Rafael Correa was president. You know very well that Rafael Correa was very close to the Cuban regime and, and he worked uh, basically uh, with Cuba, Venezuela, Bolivia, and when the Kirchner's were part of the government of Argentina, in these uh, medical missions in many countries around Latin America. But why the program or the mission ended in Ecuador? Because they say that there were more than 250 Cuban doctors, basically they said they were doctors, that came into the country with diplomatic passports during the recent months before the protest took place. But the thing and the reason behind the scenes was the assumption that there was Cuban leadership behind the protest groups in October. So the Ecuadorian government said, we know very well that there are some Cuban interests before these demonstrations and these protests in the country. So there is no program anymore in the country. A few days later of this public uh, declaration of, of Maria Paula Romo, 356 Cuban doctors out of a total of 382 left the country in two, place, two planes to Havana and Santiago de Cuba. And since then, the program has been inactive. It has been eight months from now. This is a very important fact that you must consider when talking about the medical missions in Ecuador. We look for public information regarding this program. And we discovered that between 2012 and 2019, 50 cooperation agreements were signed between the Ministry of Public Health of Ecuador and the Ministry of Public Health of Cuba. This is based on a national, huge international treaty Ecuador has with Cuba, but there were 50 specific cooperation agreements to support the Cuban medical missions. At the moment, and because of what I mentioned before, None of this is in force. And the other thing is that all the cooperation agreements were valid until December 2019. So there was even no renovation of these cooperation agreements. When talking about numbers, the program started in 2012, 2012 with 22 doctors coming from Cuba. It happened in October and November. 2012, there was a huge public event organized by the Ministry of Public Health of Ecuador saying this is just the beginning. 22 specialists from Cuba are coming to Ecuador to support the bad health system that, that has been implemented in the country from the other governments. We are going to make a health revolution 
in the country. So it all started with 22 medical uh, doctors in the program. The year after that, 2013, there were 46. But at 2014, 2014, year 2014, there was the huge amount of doctors coming to the country, 511 doctors. As you see in the chart, the amount changed during these years until 2019, that there were 371 doctors being part of this Cuban Medical Missions program. And talking about costs, this is very important. From 2012 to 2019, there were more than $56 million paid by the Ecuadorian government on the base of the 50 cooperation agreements. And the sad thing related to this program, of course, is that this huge amount of money wasn't paid directly to the doctors. It was paid directly to the Cuban government. So the Cuban government during these years received directly from the Ecuadorian government based on the cooperation agreements, more than $56 million, 56.7 basically, as you can see. And there was a huge relation, as I mentioned before, between uh, Rafael Correa's government and the Cuban regime, not only uh, related to the medical missions, not only related to this uh, program, but also to what they considered were uh, bilateral uh, cooperation on other items, as for example, scientific cooperation. So in May 2013, as an example, uh, Rafael Correa's government and the Cuban government established here the first conference of scientific exchange and technological knowledge of health. And it was the way to strengthen cooperation between both nations for the improvement of health, to being part of this health revolution. It was also a public event where the whole bunch of Cuban specialists uh, related to ophthalmology, natural medicine, community medicines, orthopedics, and other issues were working or started working in the country. There was also cooperation agreements regarding all areas of what they call higher education, but especially in health and education based on what you know very well. They usually say that the health and education system in Cuba is one of the best in the world. So Ecuador and Cuba signed also cooperation agreements related not only to the recognition by both countries of the university or college degrees and the homologation of studies, but also to award the scholarships to study general medicine and medical specialties in Cuba. So this is also important as a number because, for example, just taking uh, one year, in 2013, there were 2,512 Ecuadorian students that were awarded with a scholarship to Cuba that graduated in medicine. And there were 383 Ecuadorian students that were awarded to study in Cuba other careers and other specialties. We don't know very well what they mean with other specialties, but the huge amount of money related to scholarships in Ecuador to Cuba was directly related with the medical system. There was also, and, and I'm going to finish this introduction with this, there was also a huge protest, of course, from the national medical unions during the years from 2012 to 2019. The presidents of the Ecuadorian medical federations, even former ministers of public health, described that the cooperation between Cuba and Ecuador were bath in health because they basically left Ecuadorian doctors unemployed to give 
more money and more resources than the money and resources paid, for example, in salaries to medical Ecuadorian doctors to just push forward the relation between Cuba and Ecuador. Finally, as I mentioned, this program is not anymore in the country. There is no medical missions. And we right now don't know how many Cuban doctors stay in the country uh, until today. We have just that uh, number I gave you before, or more than 350 doctors that left the country to Santiago and Havana as soon as all the cooperation agreements ended with the government. So this is basically, Carlos, as a brief introduction with some data related to what, what I have been looking for. Oh, it's excellent. It, it, is, it is a situation that is a, it's, it's almost the same uh, way of operating. Uh, we see that the same, or we saw the same thing in Brazil, how they exploited the doctor, how they created a system. The difference in the Brazil is PAHO also participated. The Pan American Health Organization also was part of this charade. We saw the same thing in Bolivia, in the Chad, in different countries where they operate, they take advantage of the country, charge directly to the country. If we do some numbers, probably for each Cuban doctor, they the, the government of Ecuador pay a, a, approximately $70,000 and the doctors probably receive only $10,000. And, and also, the, the government, uh, in some cases, I don't know if, if that was the case in Ecuador, the government also had to cover the, the, the room, the food, the airline tickets. In one contract that we, we uh, uh, received from, from uh, Guatemala, another one from, from Uruguay, another one from Mexico, also the country had to pay for that apart from the money that do you know if that is that was the case in in ecuador too no information related to to what you are asking carlos because basically there is not transparency at all related to this mission there wasn't uh, even information regarding for example uh, how many money was spent into each doctor or, or in each case. Uh, basically, you are, you are mentioning some data and some numbers, but if I consider the number of doctors related to year 2019, that as I mentioned before, let me check, it is 300 and, 350 basically, and you cross check with the amount paid in 2019, about $6.5 million. If you, I'm, I'm gonna use the calculator right now, but if you divide $6.5 million into 350 doctors, it's $18,500 each. So now you can imagine it is about $1,500 a month per doctor. And I'm sure that they never received even a close amount of this money, not only for what they say, but also for what we saw, because it was usual here in Ecuador to see, for example, here in Quito, there is a neighborhood or there was a neighborhood there was full of Cuban medical doctors from the Cuban medical mission. It was called, and the name is, is funny, La Florida. So it was La Florida neighborhood here at the northern part of Quito, full of Cuban doctors that arrived to the medical missions. And you, for example, really were able to see in an apartment, five, six, ten people living in a small apartment. So you don't live like that because you want to live like that. You live like that because you don't have money to live in a different or in a better condition. And I'm sure that if you receive $1,500 a month, you will never live like that. So, and as the 
public system and the Ministry of Health in Ecuador confirmed this, the huge amount of money was paid directly to the Cuban government. So they never received even a single penny from the Ecuadorian government. All what they received come directly from the Cuban regime. I don't know how many uh, travels or, or how much money they received from the Cuban government, but it all depended on the money sent by Ecuador to Cuba. So you, you are an expert in, uh, in terms of human rights in, uh, in, uh, and also you have been fighting for democracy and human rights. Do you see that, that this, uh, do you think that this is a, a way uh, of violating the rights? It's a, it's a human course. right violating by the regime, exploitation, human trafficking. What, how do you see this, this whole system? Because it's a system. It, maybe, maybe we can call this uh, system as the way other governments keep the Cuban regime alive because it's mm -hmm. not only related to these Cuban medical missions. I mentioned, think about paying 2,500 scholarships to Ecuadorian people to move to Cuba to study medicine. They are not going to pay $100 each. I'm sure the Cuban government received millions of dollars based on those scholarships. So this is basically the way other governments aligned with Cuba support that regime with our money because we, the Ecuadorians in this case, were the ones giving money to the government based on our taxes. And this is basically a case of human rights violations because there was internally talking, there was no way, for example, of having those people working here in Ecuador without signing contracts with the public health ministry of the country. So based on these cooperation agreements, human rights were violated. They, mm -hmm. they didn't even received social benefits. They just received an amount of money from the Cuban government to live here in Ecuador. Who knows how they did with, for example, social security? We don't know because they were not working based on the Ecuadorian labor regime. As an example. So that, that means that that violated the, the Cuban regime also violated the labor laws in, in Ecuador with this, I, this system. I'm, I'm sure. And what they say is, we have a huge agreement, this national cooperation agreement between Cuba and Ecuador. We can sign the specific cooperation agreements uh, on education, on health, on science and technology with Cuba. So we decided to sign these 50 agreements during this period of 2012, 2019. Based on those agreements, we don't know how they manage the situation because there's no information, Carlos. What we have talked in this report is that there is not basic information related to the program that it was supposed to be related to it. For example, when we ask, as I mentioned, can you please give us the exact number of, of what type of doctors came as the, as the medical missions? And they said, well, we don't know what type of doctors came. We just know the general amount, 350, 22, 55, we don't know if those were nurses or those were uh, surgeons or yeah, we, we they, they didn't even have that basic information, Carlos. What about the 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 the, the, the role? Because obviously uh, this program begins with Korea in power. By the way, uh, your professor Korea, we, we talk about uh, as a joke all the time. Uh, Korea was a, 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 a Korea was my teacher, Carlos. You know very well that story. One of the of the worst enemy of Korea uh, is Mauricio, or was Mauricio, or still Mauricio. <laughs> but but it was ideological. Yeah, but, but but you know you know something, Carlos. I'm here in Ecuador working in my NGO with such an amazing team, and, and we are here. Correa is yeah. in Belgium right now. He is being persecuted by the Ecuadorian justice. So now that he doesn't have the power anymore, let's see who has done the things right. 
Yeah, because he, uh, Correa actually tried to, to close Fundamedios, tried to intimidate you, Cesar, and the rest of the human rights defenders. And, 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 and other and, NGOs as well. Do you remember, yeah, Carlos, yeah. that? And, and, and based on Ciudadanía y Desarrollo here with oh, us, yeah. in Lois Pinel, that works with, with us at Ciudadanía y Desarrollo. Uh, and and, and there's, there's such a funny thing that at the same time Correa was trying to shut down Fundamedios, we received a letter from the Ecuadorian government trying to shut down Ciudadanía y Desarrollo based on a decision that uh, was done by El Ministro del Interior in that, uh, in that, in that time it was not Ministro de Gobierno, that, uh, saying that as we were an NGO based on El Ministerio del Interior, we were supposed to work on security issues not on transparency, not on open government, not on those kind of things. So they started the process of shutting down Ciudadanía de Desarrollo as well. Yeah. We started another fight. Marcelo was part of that fight and we won that fight. So it was not only based on Fundamedios or Acción Ecológica that were the NGOs shut down or tried to shut down the government and publicly well known, but there were also other NGOs that were working on issues that the government felt uh, weren't right or, or were disturbing them and they just started pushing those NGOs. You remember that, for example, USAID was pushed out of the country, oh, yeah. that Conrad yeah. uh, Power Foundation also was pushed out of the country. So there was this whole system of stigmatization, of oppression, of, of, of even persecution to NGOs, activists, human rights defenders, journalists, but of course, there were other group of NGOs related, for example, and working with Cuba that were even part of uh, the funding coming from abroad, mm -hmm. money coming from German NGOs aligned with their ideology or other NGOs aligned with what they were working on here. No, it, I remember that I, I, I was a, a, a permanent, a Korean permanent mention of all of you and, and your friends. And you uh, too. mentioned all the time, the Sabatinas. Yeah, so. you, you, you were there. You were there with your picture saying, look at this Carlos Ponce. And you remember the CIA. Was, yes. Yeah, no, we, we, we all are CIA agents working on this stabilizing uh, democratic governments of Latin America. So you know very well about it. And that was- But we have some pending payment for the CIA because all, all this- uh, government I'm still waiting so for it. I'm <laughs> well, still waiting for it. Let's, 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 let's back to the-, to the So it's, it was ideological, but as yeah. well, it was ideological. There were some rumors or, or more than rumors that these um, uh, members of these medical missions mm -hmm we're creating disruption, riots, and coordinating all the, 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 the violence that occurred in, in Ecuador uh, when that mission was operating in Ecuador, by the beginning of the government of, of uh, Moreno. That was yeah, some yeah. discussion about that. Yeah, and, and of course, as I, as I mentioned, what happened in October 2019 was, was like the main reason. The government said, publicly in a press release that there were Cuban doctors, and I again mentioned Cuban doctors because we don't know if there were doctors or not, but 250 Cuban doctors coming into the country with diplomatic passports. That's, that's one strange thing that we, we really can't understand. Coming just a few weeks before the national huge protest took place in October, and they weren't even working on medical issues in the country. We know very well that there are no uh, judicial process here in the country based on that. But what the minister said on that time was that this was the reason of turning down all the cooperation agreements because they were completely sure that those doctors were behind the, the public protests. So the program formally ended on November 15th 2019, there was a work meeting, uh, an hour work meeting basically uh, between the ambassador of Cuba and the minister here in Ecuador, and they decided to end all the cooperation agreements. But with what they say, and, and that's part of the, of the document signed that 
end of the cooperation agreements that the reason was economic. So we decided to end the agreements based on economic reasons. And of course, that's the perfect reason because as you may know, Ecuador is facing an economic crisis, of course. Yeah, no, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah they, they look for, well, there they, they they, they are some members, there were some members of the uh, Moreno uh, government that has some good connection with Cuba, because we have to remember that that Moreno was part of the of the Correa's uh, government, and now he was very uh, influential, and he was very active in the political party, and then he decided to to a uh, cross uh, uh, or or decided to abandon or or stop his relationship with uh, with with Correa and, and tried because Correa made his life in, in impossible. So how uh, let's 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 deal a little bit with something that probably people uh, will we want to know because when we see a, an authoritarian country, a totalitarian country, a country controlled by the uh, the plague of the socialists of the of the tw uh, of the uh, 20, uh, 21th century. Uh, when we see that, that, that kind of countries, uh, we see that those countries are hopeless, like Nicaragua, like Venezuela. Uh, but suddenly, uh, Ecuador, even in the, in, the, in the most bizarre of the situation where everybody believes that uh, Moreno will be the same than Correa, or just a puppet of Correa, something happened. What happened in Ecuador? A miracle, basically, my dear Carlos, because uh, basically, as you know, Moreno was Correa's vice president during the first and the second term. After that, Moreno was sent to the UN as an special advisor for handicapped people, paid by the Ecuadorian government. Moreno, as this special representative before the UN, received $3 million a year for living in Geneva. So it was amazing seeing that in 2016, Correa said, I am able to run again for being your president, dear Ecuadorians, as he changed the constitution for doing that. But to show you that it's not on me, but on the revolution and the principles, someone else is gonna run for president. And they traveled to Geneva, to Switzerland, to convince Lenin Moreno to run for president. To leave those $3 million there, he, he lived in a huge apartment on, on, on just in the, in the shore of the lake, and he came here to run for president. And what Correa said to Moreno to convince him to run to president was, you have la mesa servida, a served table. You have everything fixed, so you just have to rule the country during these four years. I'm going to take vacations on Belgium, and I will come back in 2021 to be president again. So Moreno accepted, basically, it is very nice to see your picture with uh, La Banda Presidencial, and you see your picture in the presidential palace. And of course, it is very nice to be part of the history book saying that you were a president of Ecuador. So Lenin Moreno accepted. During the electoral process that took place on February and March of 2017, we really think that there was a fraud and Moreno won the elections. So Correa was happy because he was just uh, taking vacations for four years. He was moving to, to Brussels. He was going to live peacefully during four years and then he will come back again. The sad thing is that he never realized that one of the first actions that Moreno did as, as soon as he assumed power was checking the national accounts. And uh, two months later, Moreno assumed power. It was July 2017. But Moreno, through a national broadcast through TV and radio, said, there is no such thing as a served table. No hay tal cosa de la mesa servida. The country is broke. 
So I was part of basically a fantasy that don't exist or doesn't exist anymore. So Moreno started to check in the national accounts. The country was effectively broke. And there was another thing that was part of, of, of this change in the Ecuadorian politics. You know very well that Correa persecuted the indigenous movement. And one of the actions that Correa did, I think it was in 2015, was taking back a building that the government gave in the 1980s to the National Confederation of Indigenous People, La Conaye. So it, 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 it was a huge mess in the country because Correa decided to take back that building. So the indigenous movement was left with no building at all. They didn't have even a place to hold their meetings and that stuff. And July 2017, as soon as this no surf table thing happened, Moreno called the indigenous leaders to the presidential palace and asked them publicly, what do you want from my government? And the indigenous leaders said, we want our building back. And Moreno said, great, let's work on another executive decree and we'll give you that building back. As soon as it happens, Correa sent a tweet calling Lenin Moreno a traitor. And now Correa is part of the history because as you know, and I think all of you know very well, Moreno started this breaking relation with Alianza País and Correa's people are not part of the government anymore. Even the huge legislative group that was part of the National Assembly, they had more than 70 representatives over 137 that our National Assembly has, was broken. Correa holds like 35 and Moreno holds like 40 or something like that. So even they lost this huge majority that was ready at the National Assembly to keep approving laws restricting human rights, as example. So now things have changed. Moreno declared war against Correa. He changed the communications law. He has changed some other things. He has basically do a good job, I think, on transparency. Uh, the, the government has also, I think, made a good work regarding international relations, uh, even, for example, accepting uh, Ecuador as being part of the Open Government Partnership or working on, on transparency in public procurement as we are working on it. So basically, there was a huge change for us. But of course, the sad thing that we must mention is that we are facing national elections, not only for president, but also for National Assembly next February. And there is like a good political movement around Correa trying to bring him back to the national politics. Not as a president, of course, because there is a constitutional prohibition, but I really think that he's going to come back soon. Well, he's looking for immunity, of course, uh, being a member of the Congress and uh, in getting rid of, of the persecution. And just for the people to remember what happened in, in, in Ecuador. In Ecuador, Rafael Correa took all the powers, uh, took the control of the judiciary, uh, took the control of the institution, enacted law to restrict uh, freedom of expression, began to persecute all the, the newspaper, all the journals, all the media, even cartoonists, persecuted, but also a uh, supposedly uh, uh, socialist and progressive president began to persecute all the indigenous movement and environmental movement because he had plans to give away some of the prestige areas of Ecuador to his partners, uh, to his uh, uh, partners in crime to explode uh, minerals, oil, gas in those areas. So uh, let's, let's be clear of who is uh, Rafael Correa. And he also was the one trying to destroy the Inter-American human rights system. You remember that they, 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 they were to try to, to, to save the Inter-American uh, uh, human rights system from, the, from Correa and Patino, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So what is, what is the game? So how uh, these people support 
these authoritarians, self-called socialists, in, in countries in which they really destroy this country. So there's an opportunity for this guy to return to Ecuador. It's, it's not easy to, to understand why this phenomenon happens, but uh, it's based on populism. Uh, Korea is one of the best populist leaders we have had here in Ecuador, uh, telling people that uh, while he was a president, uh, they lived better, that while he was president, the uh, media uh, was better. So if you check what people think and why they still support basically Rafael Correa, because Rafael Correa is part of any single poll that is running the country. So if you check that, people definitely think that they were better with Rafael Correa because people, as, as we say in Spanish, people don't eat democracy. La gente no come democracia. They understand clearly that we're, there were some issues regarding freedom of expression, freedom of the press, uh, freedom of association, but they say, well, the economy was better. And of course, and I'm talking about what has happened in Latin America, I don't know why Latin American people love authoritarians. They love this paternal figure, uh, authoritarian, totalitarian, telling them what to see, what to do, how to live. They, they love that. I really don't understand why, but if you check Latin American history, you'll realize that it's not only related to Socialism of the Siglo XXI, or 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 now the the Puebla group. No, no, no. It's it's like a historic thing in Latin America. People loving authoritarians and totalitarians, and, and Ecuador is part of that history. If you check what has happened here, we had a lot of civil dictators, and of course, people love to have uh, authoritarian regime. And before Rafael Correa assumed power, there was. A very sad phrase that was repeated constantly, even on media, saying, ¿Cómo sería Ecuador si tuviera un Pinochet? Ecuador necesita un Pinochet. Ecuador needs someone like Augusto Pinochet. So people were wanting this totalitarian government. And Rafael Correa appeared in the exact moment. And now we are facing the consequences of that. So I, I, really, I really can't understand why. But if you check history books in Argentina, in Colombia, in Ecuador, I think Costa Rica maybe or Uruguay are the, the exceptions. But if you check the other countries, there is a totalitarian and authoritarian tradition. I don't know how, why it is, it is like that, but that's, that's part of our sad history, I think. Yeah, no, uh, uh, totalitarian and authoritarian from the left and from the right. The, the Latin right. Americans love these populist authoritarian, the caudillos, caudillos, authoritarian. Los caudillos, right. Yeah, they have been killing. But do you see hope for, for, for Ecuador? Do you see hope this upcoming election? There has been a, some restoring of the fragile democracy because uh, let's be clear: the democracy in Ecuador before Correa was not a, 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 a shining path uh, for prosperity. Uh, Ecuador had the problems, so now it's restoring some of the institutionality, some of the things. Do you see a, a future for Ecuador, even with this uh, a, a threat that uh, is behind with Correa and with uh, all the, the, the groups that are behind him? I think that one of the huge depths of Lenin Moreno during this government is to have completed the transition to democracy. Uh, right now, thinking about uh, Rafael Correa, basically, if he uh, was able to run or, or if he is allowed to run, as I mentioned, there's a prohibition right now to being reelected again. But if he runs for president and he wins the election, as soon as he becomes president, he will have almost all the laws and regulations that he left. So, as I mentioned, one of the huge deaths of Moreno's regime is to have completed the transition. Some people thought that the transition maybe must uh, be like taking out 
what they call Correistas and putting other people. And that was not what the transition was supposed to be. Because when you try to recover democracy, when you try to recover human rights, you must work on legal reforms. You must work on constitutional reforms. And of course, you must work on the restore of rule of law and institutions. And that was not done by Lenin Moreno. So he's leaving the presidency next May. And I'm really afraid, not about Correa coming back because he is not able to run for president again, but from anyone assuming power and using all the same laws, regulations, tools, and mechanisms that Correa left and are still there. So we must keep working on complete and conclude this transitional process. And we, based on what has happened during these three years, and I think a few in a few months we will talk more about it, we must teach other countries that are facing a transition to don't commit the same errors we committed here in Ecuador. Because, for example, when you look what's happening right now in Bolivia, there is a transitional government, but they are doing some stupid things as totalitarian governments also did. They are also breaking the constitution. So that's not part of the recovery of the democracy process we activists and human rights defenders try to, to, to do. Yeah, we, we will be always in the, in, the, in the order side. So when it's totalitarian, doesn't matter if it looks like, like red or it looks like blue. If it's violation of human rights, violation of, uh, of uh, fundamental freedoms, we need to be in the other, in the other side. So about that, about the rest of the region. That you have been also working uh, for years in uh, in uh, different uh, networks uh, that operate in different countries in these regions, and uh, you had an active role uh, creating, uh, engaging with the youth uh, a, a network for democracy, very active, and now it's a it's a network operative thing with the uh, red lab. And you had that active role in 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 those networks, and in those networks you saw the 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 impact of Cuba in several countries, in Venezuela, in Nicaragua. So I believe there are some lessons uh, from Ecuador and from your own uh, experience to share with, with, with our audience, since our audience is basically in the US, about this role, this negative role from Cuba in uh, Latin America uh, region. What do you have to say about that role that Cuba plays in the region? I think that the first lesson learned during this process and talking about Latin America is that we must work on prevention, not on reaction. We must not wait until something happens in a Latin American country to start reacting to recover democracy. And I mention this, for example, based on what is happening right now in El Salvador. A few years before, I, I, I worked in El Salvador in some, in some issues, and I told them, for example, you know, yeah, there's this guy, Nayib Bukele. He was the mayor of San Salvador. And I told him, I see Bukele, and I see a reloaded version of Rafael Correa. Please be careful with him. And they said, no, he's young, he's handsome, he's a good guy, he's not related to the left wing, he's part of the... Uh, right movement of Latin America, he's respected by the US, and now you see the consequences. Now you see what's happening in El Salvador. So the very first and main lesson learned during these years is that, that activists, human rights defenders, uh, what, what we are doing on advocacy, we must prevent, we must not just react. There are some countries that live in democracy right now, but because of the errors of people ruling those countries, there is the perfect spot for people like Rafael Correa, Nayib Bukele, or Cristina Kirchner to assume power. So we must take care of those countries 
to prevent. And based on what has happened in other countries and based on, on, on the transition, the other lesson is that you cannot restore rule of law breaking the rule of law. When you think about the Ecuadorian case, and that's part of what we have done here, people said, we must not take care of the constitution, we must not take care of the laws that are part of the country and our system. We just must work together to get rid of Korea's regime, no matter the price. And now, for example, Carlos, Correa, his vice president, Jorge Glass, and some other people related to his government has cases before the inter-American system saying that their human rights were violated by Moreno's regime. And when we are asked about those issues, we say, yes, unfortunately, their human rights are also violated. So the other lesson is you cannot restore, you cannot recover rule of law breaking the rule of law. You must play their game. You must play with their rules. That's the only way to get rid of them. That's the only way of not uh, transforming those guys in victims. They are not victims. We and our countries are victims of what they have done during these years. So we must be clear on what steps we have and what steps we take on what we do in our countries. So that's the second lesson. And of course, the third one, you must finish the transition. You must not keep a transition open. You must recover institutions, you must change laws, and you must change the constitution. Because one of the first things these people, these authoritarian and totalitarian leaders do, is to change the constitution, to make it uh, basically a, a, a well-fit size constitution for them. So we must change their laws, we must change their regulations to restore democracy and to restore the rule of law. So basically those three, Carlos, if we work on those three lessons learned, mm -hmm. I'm sure we can do something great for this region and we can do something great for those countries that are fighting for democracy right now. Yeah, having the courage also to, to do that, uh, to impose the changes, because in some cases, they, 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 they are so afraid of the response or they are so afraid of the consequences what happened in Argentina, that the, the government uh, of Macri was so afraid of everything that he uh, did nothing. And Cristina returned as vice fee, but returned to power. With, uh, with all the laws and regulations, with yeah. all, all the laws and regulations approved by her government. Oh yeah. Oh, so yeah. It, it is great for her, of, of course, she's the VP, but she rules the country. She knows very well how to put a judge in the National Supreme Court. She knows very well how to deal with justice, how to deal the electoral system, because she now is the VP with the exact same system she left when she was president. So there was no change at all. There was no transition in Argentina. You, no. The example you gave is perfect. Yeah, no, Argentina, and you see that that going on forever. And what you say is, is really appropriate also. Uh, you, you cannot fight this regime. Uh, it began get rid of the regime, and then when you are in power, it begins to violate human rights, use the laws from this regime, because you became the same thing, and open the door for right. them to return. And that's, and that's why they say about us, for example, because when we... Uh, participate in a panel or we have an interview in a national media, we tell people, for example, uh, you must respect due process in this trial against Rafael Correa. And they say, why respecting due process to him if he never respected due process to anybody? So now Rafael Correa is a victim because his due process is not being respected. So that's a stupid Carlos. No, it's just stupid. I remember when, when we got rid of Chavez for 24 hours. I was almost the first one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> after fighting, fighting, fighting against Chavez, 
Finally, we got rid of Chavez, and probably after one hour, I began to complain about the, the violation of, of, the, of the rule of law, the manipulation, all of the things that, that were happening. And people got mad about that, because how this guy who's against these regimes, against us, is now a, a beginning to denounce a, a, a new structure that only beginning to open it because it's true. If not, they return. And there was so, a conversation I had even with, with somebody close to me, uh, and she got really mad at it. And I told her, he's going to return. Chavez is going to return. And then yeah. we're not going to get rid of uh, 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 until he died. And, and it happened. And it happened. And well, until he died, and then Maduro. But it, because we have to be better than them. And plan uh, and, and, and time, the and time proved that we were right, Carlos. So, based on those experiences, we must do the things right. We must not commit the same mistakes and errors they commit. We yeah. must do things right. We must restore democracy. We must recover the rule of law, respecting the rule of law. We must do a good transition in our countries. If we don't do that, there's a huge chance of, of becoming Argentina. And oh, they yeah. will be back. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, let's back to the, to the medical program since we only have so five minutes more and we have a question here. It's about the, the, the fellowships, the scholarships of the Ecuadorian to study in Cuba. Uh, they want to know if, if uh, the Latin American School of Medicine was associated with that, if you know. But what happened with this uh, people that were training in Cuba? They are back in Ecuador, what they are doing right now, they are the, the base of power of, of Correa. What happened with these people? Are they a part of the international movement? What happened with the doctors that graduated in Cuba? Are they, 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 are they uh, operating in, in, in Ecuador? What happened with all those, those people? Based, based on what we collected from some uh, newspapers and, and news agencies, there are countless Ecuadorians who have traveled to Cuba, awarded scholarships to study, as I mentioned, general medicine and medical specialties. Uh, this scholarship program that Correa's government ran during 2007 and 2017 uh, basically compromised people to come back to the country after graduating to implement activities, programs uh, here in the country. The thing here uh, about what you have mentioned, there's, for example, a press release from the Ministry of Public Health saying that uh, 520 Ecuadorians have graduated from the Latin American School of Medical Sciences, of course, but there is no exact data and even the government is not able to give us the names or, 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 or some other data related to people participating in this scholarship program. So there is countless number of people participating in this, we don't know about them. Uh, they got uh, their degrees at the Latin American School of Medical Sciences. We don't know if they are here, if they are in Cuba, because the lack of transparency is one of the main access of these Cuban medical missions and of uh, the educational uh, program that Cuba and Ecuador held during this time. Well, no, let's... let's uh... It has been very informative. Uh, we are uh, at the last uh, minutes of the, the last minute of this program. Uh, thank you, Mauricio. Uh, your work, uh, your uh, contribution to your country, to the region, it's uh, it's uh, uh, unbelievable. It has been extraordinary to work with you and uh, to share the same battlefield. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for your contribution and thank you for, for your report about Ecuador and exposing this uh, medical mission in Ecuador. Thank you very much and thank you to everyone uh, for participating in this program today.